This video explains the exercise that I normally do on a whiteboard with index cards and the, the exercise is applying the theory of constraints to an agile task board with the aim of improving that flow. Prior to showing people the, the whiteboard, I use index cards to space out my columns. You can see all the dark blue rectangles here represent index cards. So some of the columns are two cards wide, some are one card wide, and that'll make more sense later on. Uh, so I just use that for initial spacing. This is what the students would see when we first start the discussion, an empty task board with the columns populated. To, by then, I then start to populate it, I should say, um, by putting on index cards in each of the, the workflow states to represent where we're at, what's the current state, and move on to step one of the theory of constraints, which is to identify the constraint. Asking the students, some people will point out testing is the constraint, there's too much work in testing, that it's all piling up. Other people will point out acceptance as the bottleneck, uh, they, they, they blame the product people, the product people aren't accepting all their work, we've got all this work ready to be tested, and then they're not doing it in time, so nothing's getting done. So from this information we have, it's not really clear who's correct. So having a side where we split out the testing column into the doing and ready states. So doing is where there's people actually doing testing, they're actually working on it, and ready indicates that the work has been tested and it's ready to move on to acceptance. This means that a bunch of the cards that were in the testing column actually go back to the review column. Um, and now we can clearly see that testing in this situation is the bottleneck. It's very evident. We have all that work piling up, ready to be tested. We can then go back through the other columns, applying the doing and ready uh, states which now makes it much more sense as to why there were two cards wide. And we've got good, good visibility across all the, the workflow states now about what's progressing and what's not progressing because we're not getting to done. So now we're ready to move on to the next step of the theory of constraints, which is to exploit the constraint. And primarily we're going to do this by limiting the work in progress and testing and ultimately getting some flow through the system. I've chosen five as the number. It's it's a good starting point for most situations, but it's really down to whatever situation you have. So here we've, we've picked five as the workflow state so that they're not going to dig a bigger hole than what they already have. So let the system run. So I moved some cards around to represent the system in action. Now that we've applied that work in progress limit, we can see that some things are progressing through to done but the constraint remains. We still have a lot of things that have been reviewed waiting to be tested. So we move on to the next step of the theory of constraints, which is to subordinate all other workflow steps. So we take that work in progress limit of five and we push that back up the workflow. Primarily this is going to prevent the other workflow steps from generating too much work and, and building up waste, building up work that's ready to be done that can't be done by the bottleneck. So now we run the system again, let it flow, I move some more cards around, we get some more things to done, but the constraint's still there. We still have a, a big bottleneck, um, a big pile of work waiting to be tested. So we move on to the next step of the theory of constraints, which is to elevate the constraints. This is doing everything we can to make their job easier. How can we support them? How can we help them? How can we get them working better? So we can talk about the different options with students in the class and one of those a couple of those are getting the developers to do more testing preparation work so in the coding and review steps they can do more thorough reviews they can prepare testing data for the testers they can make sure the testing environments are up and running we can get devs and QAs pairing together this, this helps all across the board helps the quality helps their understanding and then that improves the, the testing throughput. And the situation, yeah, that's helped break the constraint. So we've now got the devs and the QAs working together. Testing now has three items in its column when it's got a limit of five. There's only a couple of items in review, 
and there's now actually five items in coding with three of them ready to be reviewed. So it looks like the constraint's been broken and it's moved on to review. Review is now the constraint and we can apply the whole system again. I find that this exercise and the discussions that go along with it really helps people to understand what the theory of constraints is and how you can really use it into in your day-to-day -day work. And as you can see from a board that at the start had a very deep um, backlog of work in testing or waiting to be tested, we now have a much narrower value stream um, with, with improved flow. And we could potentially look at uh, reducing limits further on some of those columns if we need to, but we'd use the theory of constraints to help guide that. Thanks for watching.